Well, I didn't want to uh, keep the be done just yet, so you can have a seat. What we're going to do is we're going to spend just a couple of minutes asking Keith some questions. Um, so the first slide I had was uh, questions with a practitioner. I think they were out there missional, having missional conversations because I think the, the challenge is, is how do we do this in everyday life? And I put questions with a practitioner because I was going to put questions with a master, and then I remembered Sarah's not going to be up here, so <laughs> it's just with you. I didn't want to. <laughs> um, but we've been in this series called The Missional Life, and the goal for us at this church is to, to recognize ways that God's inviting us to participate in his mission in the world. Um, if God is about renewing all things, how do we fit in that story? What's our goal? What are, what's our mission as we enter in and participate with God? Because it, it seems like the church at large, like global missions make sense, right? There's a few people that we're going to empower, we're going to financially um, back, and we're going to send across the world. But I think the challenge for us at churches locally, especially in San Diego, is, well, what does that look like for us locally? If, if we truly are missionaries, in some sense, to a broken and rebellious world, that is San Diego, how do we participate with what God's doing on mission? So I think it's important for us to kind of demystify what it means to be on mission um, and to recognize that there are ways that we can participate in evangelism in sharing the gospel with people all around us, like Colossians 4, 6, like you just read, so that you may know how to answer each one. I love how it doesn't say, so that if you are a global missionary, you know how to answer each one. No, it's all of us in this family of God. How do we represent the kingdom um, and share people the gospel? So I have a couple questions I wanted to ask Keith. We'll put them on the hot seat, quite literally, in front of all of us. Um, and then uh, we'll just, I'd just love to see how you answer some of these questions and maybe make it a little even more practical or as we apply certain, these certain things to our lives. Um, so the first question I had was, you, um, you started off with be thankful for certain people, right? And there's certain people in our stories that I think represent God's hand or his movement towards us as they share the gospel. Um, when thinking about having missional conversations with people in our lives, I think it can be really helpful to look back at those people that were in our own. And that kind of helped guide or direct or change the course of our lives um, as God was calling and leading us. Um, can you think back and identify maybe a key conversation with a family member or a friend or someone who was in your church family that God used to shape your life? Yeah, um, you know, I think a really interesting way to put this is I had someone shared this with me once and they said, you're going to have a lot of people come through your life, right? And a good way to look at this is, uh, let's say everyone, okay, let's say one, on a scale from one to 100, okay, one is they hate Jesus, they hate the church, they're like the most angry person you've ever met in your life, okay? 100 is like the best Christian that's ever existed, okay, right? 50 is the point of conversion. And um, someone once said, your job is every single person that you meet is to hopefully move that person somewhere up that they are higher on the scale that they were before you met them, right? This changes it a little bit because it doesn't just make it now just simply conversion, right? But it makes it, what are we doing to move these people on a scale a little bit closer to Jesus, right? Um, so that didn't answer your question. Okay, I wanted to just hijack that for a second. Um, uh, but I think in our church, uh, we've seen both, right? When we were in Thailand, um, we have had some people come in who had zero gospel experience, right? They, they came uh, out of communist China. They had never heard anything. These people would just show up to church uh, because they just didn't know what church was. And they're like, this is fun, you know? And we were able to have some of those entry-level conversations with them. Um, and they moved on to other churches and eventually, we hope, get saved, right? And we've had other people uh, come through our churches. Uh, we had one girl, uh, this is probably not super helpful missional, but she was from China and she was part of that Eastern Lightning cult. <laughs> you know the cult? It's like there's like Jesus and then there's like female Jesus. Anyways, that's she, new to us. Thank you for sharing. This is really, yeah, this is not helping at all. But I'm trying to, but she went to this church and they had a little bit of the truth, right? She went there, they did give her a Bible, okay? And she did read some of the Bible. And even her, in her non Christian background, was able to know something was a little bit screwy here, but she had some exposure to the truth, right? And so when she came to our church, she plugged in for a little bit, and eventually we saw this girl get saved and get baptized. And um, what was the difference between her and some of the other people? It was exposure to God's word uh, that brought her in. Right on. And I think it's important for us to recognize that we all have that opportunity 
to help move people on this scale. Maybe we'll call it the Nigenfine scale so all of you can remember it. Um, but everyone's in a different place, and we, are, as followers of Jesus, are helping people along the way to encourage, to show them who Jesus is in the gospel. Um, was, I was trying to get a little personal. Was there someone in your life that you can look back to that helped you navigate with a, kind of a key conversation? You're saying in, in, in my your life, life yeah. moving me up the scale or moving towards missions. Um, yeah, I mean, for me personally, it was, um, they actually spoke at this church probably, I think Pastor Dave said they were the first missionaries he ever had when they were here. My grandparents, so we skipped a generation, my dad is a businessman, uh, but my grandparents were missionaries uh, with the Alliance. And um, my grandfather was just such an example of faithfulness. A guy was, after he retired for another 15 years until he was 93, he worked as a hospital chaplain at Sharp. Um, was, you know, this guy's older and more sick than half the patients he's visiting, you know, but he's still shuffling around the hospital uh, with a cane trying to tell people the good news of Jesus. And um, every conversation I had with him was like life-giving and re-put me back on purpose, you know. That's awesome. Yeah, and I think it's important to recognize there's people in all of your lives that you can look back to and say, it was a grandparent, it was a close friend, or someone helped you along the way. So God spoke to someone and helped shape your life. And every one of us have that opportunity in someone's life um, with coworkers, with family members, with friends. And I think it's important for us to recognize that, um, that we have a part to play. And I think you were um, alluding to that as well. Um, the second question I had is, why is it so hard to talk about atonement over lunch? Like, <laughs> why, what, what are the challenges that you see coming back to the U.S. of sharing our faith in, in moments of every day? Why is it so hard to do that? I think it's cultural. But I think the funny thing is, is that I think we are mo- more culturally scared than people are actually not receptive. Um, and so it's been very few times, uh, I think, where I've had interactions with people. I had a really interesting thing in Thailand. Um, we had a guy, he was Thai, but he was American, actually. Um, he grew up here, I think he moved to the States when he was two years old. He was ethnically Thai, um, but he was from Fresno. Uh, so. Um, Grew up in Fresno, did his PhD, um, was, a, was a psychology professor, and I met him on, on campus, and uh, I said, hey, I want to grab lunch, and this dude knew right away what I was up to, and he said, he said, I will have lunch with you, he said, but don't talk to me about Jesus, <laughs> he, said, he said, he said, I know, you know, he's like, if you want to just be friends, um, he's like, we can go to lunch, um, and uh, I was like, okay, yeah, cool, sure, I probably lied a little bit uh, to him. Well, apparently I did lie because we go to lunch, okay? First lunch, dude wants to talk about Jesus. The whole lunch, all right? Long story, there were some supernatural things, but long story short, about a year later, this guy's a Christian um, and is still walking with the Lord. Um, So even people who seem non-receptive, I think if we can do it in grace and in love, I think a lot of the barriers are with us more than it is with the other people. Uh, We feel more awkward than they feel awkward. So. Yeah, that's a good word. Awesome. Uh, maybe last question. Um, what did you do overseas, you, Sarah, and your family? What did you guys do overseas um, that you're going to bring back here to San Diego? Like, how are you going to be missional as you live in Carlsbad? I think a lot of things that we practiced as missionaries should literally just be what we practice as whatever we do, you know? And so a lot of stuff we did with missionaries, it wasn't that dynamic, right? It was just being intentional with everyone we meet, you know, Um, having our neighbors over for dinner, always being ready to make the most of every opportunity. And um, sometimes it's almost like you can put on a missionary hat and be like, all right, I'm on mission field now, time to be kingdom oriented, right? And now, oh, now I'm back in San Diego, time to chill, you know? And um, I think the biggest thing to realize is that that missional living has nothing, that's not a profession, okay? Yeah, maybe preaching and giving communion, that's a profession, right? But kingdom living, inviting our neighbors over for dinner, always looking at our neighborhood and saying, who here is God potentially placed in our lives? Um, I hope that we take that back, and I hope that we're just as kingdom-oriented as we were there. Amen. So maybe one more question I lied to. Uh, last one. Um, what vision or hope do you have for the church in San Diego, as it pertains to the way we participate in God's mission, how would you encourage us um, in taking the next step of just being on mission in San Diego? Yeah. Um, 
So I, I've told Lance this a few different times, but um, I'm really excited about the Alliance Church in San Diego. We have about, I think, what, 10, 10 churches in here? Um, and all of them are kind of at this stage where they're like, we really want to, we're really on fire to reach San Diego. We're really on fire to do missions. How can we do it together? And so I'm hoping that, that our churches in San Diego can partner together and can not only see San Diego one, but can really come together as one unit with one heartbeat um, and, and make a global impact together. And I think as, as we have more of this CMA DNA, we have a stronger identity that we're a bigger part of a family, that we're not just building up our own empires here. Um, I really think that we'll be able to make kingdom impact. So I think for me, more global orientation, while at the same time maintaining that focus here on land really would awesome. push it. All right, can we give Keith a hand? Thanks, Keith.